26% uh, who will definitely or probably vote no. Um, that 26% uh, is, is um, those no voters, we can pretty much ignore those, right? They're never, we're never gonna change their minds. We're not gonna spend our time, our money, our resources trying to convince no's to turn to yeses. There's just no way that's gonna happen. They have a fundamental belief, um, and usually what's interesting about their fundamental belief is it's not about the library at all. The library is about taxes, right? And it's about government, and that's what they're against. It has nothing to do with the library, so it's really, it's, it's really hard when you start getting no's to uh, not take that personally, right? You knock on somebody's door, are you gonna vote for the library? And they tell you no. Uh, it's hard to take that, it's hard to not take that personally and try and like talk them into voting yes or sending them more information to vote yes, but they're not voting yes against the library, they're voting yes, or they're voting no against um, uh, taxes and government almost every time. It's really hard to find somebody who says, I don't support the library, right? Even if they're saying stuff like, uh, like we don't need libraries, we have Google now. Uh, if you talk to them a little bit more and get a little bit deeper into it, they're saying that as justification for their anti-government or anti-tax beliefs, right? It's not, it doesn't work the other way around. Right? So then you have this other 37% right in the middle, which is they will probably vote yes for the library. That uh, middle 37%, that's where all of our money and resources are gonna be spent. Those are the people we wanna talk about. If you guys remember in the Romney campaign, when he came out and he says he's only talking to the 47%, he doesn't care about anybody else, right? That was absolutely right. He just never should have told anybody that, right? <laughs> uh, that, was, uh, that was something that his campaign managers were telling him over and over and over again, um, because that's where your resources need to be spent, that's where they're most effective. You just don't talk about it really in the campaign, right? Mm -hmm. But we are gonna talk about it. Um, this middle 37%, these are the people that you're gonna spend time like sending pieces of mail to. Um, uh, they're called persuasion mail. They're gonna, they're gonna be um, people that you wanna send an email to. They're people who you wanna knock on their door or phone call and have as many contacts with as possible to convince them to vote yes, right? Your yes voters, you can just leave them alone. They're gonna vote yes. Your no voters, you can leave them. They're gonna vote no. It's that middle 37 that you wanna switch over to our side, right? Okay. Um, what is interesting also about the data is that um, party affiliation doesn't matter. And it's really easy uh, in politics or in, uh, in libraries. Um, libraries tend to be farther left. Um, uh, librarians tend to be far, farther left. Uh, we're doing this for the social good. We have those social beliefs, that kind of stuff. And we kind of get into it in this profession that we don't believe that people on the right will vote for us. That's absolutely not true. We are really well supported on that middle modern America on both sides of the curve. It's when you start getting out to the edges that the data gets a little bit weird. We start talking about Tea Party. We start talking about libertarian because those are both anti-tax, anti-government belief systems. But for most of modern America, we're pretty well supported, right? If you're, if you're Republican or if you're Democrat, it doesn't really matter. Pretty well supported. Um, so I want to I want to I want to uh, kind of nip that bias in the bud right now. Um, also, library card stats don't matter. Um, it doesn't matter what the population is in the community that have library cards. Uh, that doesn't have any correlation to the number of, the number of people in the community who are gonna vote for your library. Um, you could have, you know, 25% of the people in your community have, have a library card, but we've seen, you know, 60, 70% voter turnout voting yes for the library. It just doesn't really, there's no correlation between those numbers, um, which is interesting. Uh, library use also doesn't matter. Um, you guys, you guys might see this in your libraries if you guys work in the library, um, or if you work around the library. You know, um, you have that guy who comes in and uses the library every single day. He's on that computer every single day, but he's researching Obama's birth certificate, or 9/11 being an inside job, or like all that other kind of stuff. He's never going to vote for your library, but he uses it every single day, right? And you also have, you also have. Uh, the, uh, the, the, wealthy, the wealthy couples with the children who you think would use the library because you have resources for them, but they have enough money that their nanny who does their story times for them or that they can order all their books on Amazon, uh, they have a high-speed internet connection at home, all those kinds of things. But they have a fundamental belief about the good of the other. Um, they understand that other people need these services. They understand that um, libraries are important. Maybe they have a childhood when they were a child, they, they're voting on nostalgia. When they were a kid, they had a great children's librarian uh, that they remember, and so they're always gonna vote yes for libraries. You know? So you kind of have this kind of stuff. Um, so libraries just doesn't matter. And we talk about this a lot too because a lot of libraries, 
Um, uh, want to just focus on the people who use the library as their voter base, and that's not always the case, right? You gotta, we got to reach beyond that a bit. Um, but there's one thing that changes everything. There's one thing um, that you do see a strong correlation in the data, um, and that is people's relationships to the people who work in and around the library and their um, willingness to go vote for the library, right? So. Uh, it's really easy for me to vote against the library as a giant government bureaucracy wasting my tax money, but it's really hard for me to vote against, you know, uh, Mel here who reads my kids' stories on Saturdays. And I know we're spending my tax dollars well because I've seen her hard at work, I've seen the work that she puts in the programs and services. That is one of those things that really drives voter engagement up, is people believe about librarians, library staff members. I mean, you hear this a little bit when, um, uh, you hear things about like uh, on the negative side about um, uh, uh, like like public employee benefits, right? You kind of hear that on the negative side, but people who come in and they see the hard work that librarians do, when they see what librarians are doing every single day, how hard they work, um, how much they care about the community, that's what we see drive up voter and voters uh, drive voters to the polls to vote yes for libraries. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, but what's interesting about that is what that does for all of us is that makes us all essentially candidates, right? All our, all our money comes from the will of other people or the will of the local politicians. We are the ones who have the most influence over that. Uh, we are essentially politicians running, to, running on this uh, campaign for honestly our paycheck, but also for improved services, for our beliefs about the community, the things that, uh, things that we want to provide to the community to better our work, and better what the library can do for the community, right? So, I mean, that is our that is essentially our platform as librarians. So, there are only two things that politicians respond to, and that is people, and that is money. Um, that's all that voters respond to, that's all that politics is, is people, and that's money. Uh, when you break it down to those two things, it's really, really starts to be easy to run a campaign. You have to ask for money to run your campaign, you have to ask people to vote for it, um, and everything that we need to be doing from now forward has to be getting one of these two things, right? Um, the activities that you're doing, um, you know, that's why I send around that, uh, that list because we run our organization like a political campaign. We want you guys to sign up and be on our side and be people in our database so that um, we can get you engaged in the fight for libraries, right? Um, uh, getting money, doing fundraising, um, seeking grants or whatever it is that you need to do. Um, as an organization, if you want to ask the wealthy people to come in and, fund and give money to the political campaign, that's a big part of a political campaign. In fact, they say that most candidates spend about 30% of their campaign time direct fundraising, right? Um, and that's something that, that should be thought about within this group, is how much time are you willing to put in to the fundraising piece that's going to give you the tools and the resources that you need to be able to, uh, to succeed here. I mean, as libraries though, I mean, we fought against, uh, every library has fought against the Koch brothers in Plainfield, Illinois. They spent, we think somewhere around $60,000 to tank one of the campaigns for a new library. Um, they're the Koch, they're Koch brothers. They have billions of dollars behind it. Uh, we're never gonna have billions of dollars as a library organization. Unfortunately, we're never gonna have NRA money. We're never gonna have Koch brothers money. But because we're so well supported, we can get the people, right? And getting the people can be just as powerful if we get the people. And if we get the people to show up to rallies, if we get the people to show up to events, if we get people to sign petitions, if we get people to sign letters, um, if we get people to vote, uh, we can get the people. And so that's kind of our big strength as libraries because we are supported uh, somewhere around 80% in most communities. You're supported just based on level of support, supported 80%. When we've asked people to, whether they're gonna vote, that's where the numbers change, but we have the people on our side in almost every single community. So um, we're gonna talk about how do we get those people, and that's kind of what this session is gonna be about. We're gonna talk about how do you find out who those people are, how do you get to them, how do you talk to them, all that kind of stuff. So the first major concept that I wanna introduce is called this ladder of engagement. I think I've already done this, yeah. So uh, this ladder of engagement is a community organizing tool. You know, uh, in the beginning, in like, the early 2000s, we had a big push to brand libraries, run libraries like a business. We started talking about the patrons as customers, and we started talking about like uh, uh, sales cycles and that kind of stuff. Um, I think there was a lot to learn there. I think libraries, because we are political organizations, 
this right here, this ladder of engagement comes right out of community organizing. Um, and instead of moving people through a uh, sales cycle, we need to be moving people up a ladder of engagement. Moving people through the ladder of engagement will increase library usage and that's fine. I don't care about library usage when we're doing this kind of work because remember that data before, it doesn't matter if you use the library or not, they can still support the library. Doesn't matter, you don't need to have a library card to vote for a library, it doesn't matter. Um, I don't care about people using library, I care about people supporting the library. Okay. Um, I do, as, on a personal level, care, by the way, about people using the library, but as, a, as an organization, I don't care. So we have, I mean, luckily libraries, I mean, most people are aware of the library, right? So we have a lot of people right here. Like, most people are aware of the library, whether or not they use it, we have most people right here. Our job throughout this campaign is to get people as far up here as we possibly can. Um, interested, this is like, uh, this is people who, I mean, this might be some of you. Um, interactive, this is actually probably a little bit closer to where a lot of you are. You showed up today, you came to this meeting, you want to learn more, you want to support the library. Um, some of you might even be all the way up here, people like Catherine, right, might be all the way up here. Um, who, who calls and emails me and talks about what we can do, she's probably up here. Um, but we want people in this area right here, if we're going to start talking about voting for libraries, signing petitions, writing letters to the editor, that kind of stuff. We want to get some people there as we possibly can. So ladder of engagement. So we have uh, a couple of guiding principles, and I'm gonna talk about this. Uh, one, of, one of the things that we don't do enough in library school is teach people basically what a paycheck is as candidates. Uh, we, don't set, we don't tell people how to, how to be political. And so I'm gonna do like a real brief candidate training. If any of you are interested, and I always recommend people go to candidate training, um, you can Google it, there's a lot of them, there's a lot of great YouTube videos on candidate training. If you show up to do a candidate training, uh, it's usually like a weekend or a week long, it's highly intensive, they tell you like how to dress, how to talk, um, how to kiss babies, shake hands, all that kind of stuff. Um, they talk to you about how to organize communities and convey your messages and all that kind of stuff. So what I'm gonna kind of go through here, is um, I'm gonna go from the very basics of candidate school all the way up. Um, nowhere near as intensive in real candidate school, like they will make you cry, uh, they will make you search your soul, they will do all this stuff uh, uh, to you personally. We're not gonna do all that. But the first rule here is the, is the Haycock rule, and we only call it this because I don't have another good name for it. Ken Haycock is um, the dean of the information school at um, UC Santa Clara. And he actually, when we first started this project, he sat down with us and started talking to us about why it is that people do things for other people, right? Like, why does your buddy help you move, right? Not just because he has a truck, right? But like, uh, he helps you move. Um, how many people, who has an idea about why your friend helps you move? Because he has a truck. Because he has a truck, right? You offer a piece of beer, whatever. You help him move last Yeah, because he likes you, right? And that's usually, and that's usually what people say, okay? And that's, that's the answer that we get when Ken told us this. But it actually turns out that people are more likely to help you, not because they like you, but because they perceive that you like them, right? Oh. They perceive that you like them, that you support them, that you're their friend. They're more, that's what drives people to do things for you. And so uh, what's interesting about that, just that quick change of frame and that quick change of reference, is that puts all the pressure onto you, right? Like it's my job now to convey to everybody around me that I'm their friend, I'm their buddy, I'm there to help them, I'm there to you know, do whatever. I'm there to like them. And, and I saw when he said this, I saw this play out in my own career. The worst meetings that I ever had, the ones that I didn't get what I wanted from, um, the ones that went the worst were the ones where I just did not like that person yeah. sitting across the table from me. I didn't get what I wanted because, and that's all my fault, right? If I would have gone in more positively, um, if I would have gone in, a little bit more open, uh, with a, a more open mind. If I would have gone in there and acted like we're gonna go fishing on the weekend, I probably would have gotten a lot more out of that meeting. Right? I probably would have gotten a lot more of what I asked for. Um, and so that's the first thing that I wanna talk about. Right? So next, um, Dread Pirate Roberts. Uh, how, many, how many of you have seen The Princess Bride? Okay. If you haven't seen The Princess Bride, it's one of the finest movies ever made. Um, uh, the, story, the, story, the story behind, and, and we use this one because most people have seen The Princess Bride, but if you haven't seen it, um, what happens is, uh, this is Wesley, and he is, uh, he is Pirate, Pirate Roberts right here. Um, and what happens is, is, five years earlier, he gets kidnapped and, uh, uh, by the Dread Pirate Roberts, and the Dread Pirate Roberts takes him hostage, but then 
um, starts teaching him how to be the Dread Pirate Roberts. And he gives him his clothes, he gives him his ship, he starts referring to him as Dread Pirate Roberts. And then every, all the people on the crew start referring to Dread Pirate Roberts when they go mar marauding. The old Dread Pirate Roberts retires and lives in the villa somewhere, you know. Um, uh, but now he's become Dread Pirate Roberts. And that's that transference of power that I'm really talking about here. Um, when we do these, when we, when we talk to librarians about going and talking to the mayor, or talking to city council, or chamber of commerce, sorcery club, or Al whatever, a lot of times they don't feel like they're qualified to be in that room and talk, right? And you don't feel like, you know, you're talking to the executive of Clorox, which you guys have out here, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but what you need to remember is that you are the, you are the one in that room who's the most qualified to talk about libraries. He can talk about bleach, but you guys can talk about libraries as much as you, it, it, you, you are the most qualified person in that room. You have the power of your business card behind you, which, by the way, is one of the most powerful tools in the entire world. You can have a business card that says anything on it, and you can get passed off just about anywhere with just a business card. That's ID, right? I mean, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, but because you show up to this meeting, because you're on um, uh, the board of trustees or the friends group, or you work in the library, you have the power of the library behind you. You're the most qualified person ever to talk about libraries. Don't be afraid of that, right? Don't be afraid of that. Um, all right. So uh, this is from. Um, you don't have to read all this text. It's just it's just this down here. You can read it all while I'm talking if you want. Um, so this is from this is from Saul Alinsky, and. Um, you know, I'm not going to make any comments on his politics or whatever, um, but he wrote a book called Bills for Radicals uh, that whether or not the right says that they use Alinsky methods, they absolutely do. Uh, we've been to tra trainings on both sides of the aisle. Both sides read Rules for Radicals and use it deeply, whether they admit it or not. But, um, but one of the things that, that, that I, I, want, I want people to understand is we can't just show up and then expect these wild, crazy changes. Like next year, they're going to rebuild all the libraries. We're going to be well funded. You know, our librarians are going to be well paid. We're going to be able to hire a bunch more staff. We're going to do all these great services in the community. I mean, that's not going to happen overnight. Um, what I want you to understand is it's necessary to begin where the world is. And if we're going to change it to the way we think it should mean, that means working within the system, right? We can't we can't step outside the system. We can't. Uh, uh, he has a bunch of good examples in here too. Um, uh, but showing up, showing up and, and, and being a part of the system is really the only way to get the system to change. Um, showing up and you can push from the outside of the system, but if you're demanding some radical stuff as an outsider, the system's not going to listen to you, they're going to push you out, right? Uh, you have to work within the system to get the changes that you want done. Um, all right, so we're going to do a couple of, we're going to do a couple of uh, just like body language fun activities a little bit. I'm just guess moving, but the first thing is uh, your, your attitude matters. We kind of talked about it with the Dread Pirate Roberts rule, right? Um, smile, be positive, be friendly when you're going to meetings, when you're tabling, when you're doing phone calling, when you're knocking on doors. That positivity, even in the face of opposition, even in the face of opponents, um, uh, is a really powerful tool. Turning negative on them, uh, getting negative turns more people against you. Um, you don't want to do that, okay? So anytime, anytime that you have the opportunity to be positive, and if you're working on the front desk, or if you're doing any of the stuff within your library, that positivity really goes a long way as a candidate. I mean, you really rarely see a candidate, a political candidate, lash out in some really negative way, except just recently, right? <laughs> um, uh, uh, I mean, you, 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 don't, you, don't, you don't see it very often. Um, you, don't see it, you don't see it work very often. And uh, uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't know. So anyway, um, so you know a little bit about this year's about this year's politics. Um, nobody knows what's going to happen. You guys are planning on doing stuff around November. It's going to be a crazy thing. Don't worry about it. Um, we're just going to move past it. All right, handshakes. So here's the thing about handshakes. I'm going to have Mel come up here. So Mel is uh, on the board of every library, um, and she's also the the fifth floor manager at San at San Francisco Public Library. Okay. Um, so she's going to demonstrate this with me. Now, handshakes uh, are really important. People tend to judge you in the first 30 seconds of meeting you. What happens within those first 30 seconds? You get a handshake, right? Mm -hmm. And so we are in an era where handshakes are changing, especially between men and women. Um, I'm not saying that, like we're not. I'm not changing, but you know that the way the way women behave in business and the way the way men behave in business, we're coming together. We're starting to work together a little bit more. But the way that the way you know. Um, to do a handshake properly is web to web, right? Grip, and then you know just quick shake, right? 
Now, a, a, a lot of times when I'm doing these kinds of things and I'm, and I'm uh, uh, meeting with people in the workforce or sometimes, sometimes you get this handshake, right? You know, you don't want to do this, you know? We're not dainty anymore. You're there, you're there to, to you know, claim your place at the table. Um, you're there to exert your, your, your force and your power and, and let them know that you're there to be serious and to be a business person and be with them. So making sure that we're, we're doing this proper handshake. Now, the thing is, this is a power move. Don't do this to people, right? If, you, if somebody comes up and they shake your hand like this, this is a big power move. Now, sometimes you might want to, just, you know, whatever, just for fun. But, um, and, this, and you don't want to have your hand underneath either, because that's kind of like a submissive position in a handshake. So, so there's, there's a lot to be said with these kinds of like little details. Um, uh, there's a lot of great books in the library. Check one out on this kind of stuff. So handshakes, hand to hand like this. I want everybody to actually practice with their neighbor handshakes just for a second. Try, try shaking it um, and that kind of stuff. But we'll talk a little bit more about psychology. And there are some differences there. For the most part, this is like the standard, right? Um, uh, and you're gonna come into contact with other people who are from other cultures and it's gonna be different. Um, that is something that we will need to understand and, and be aware of. I'm not gonna get into all the different, I mean, there's just so many nuanced cultures that I can't, I, I can't, I can't spend that kind of time. So, the next one is eye contact, though. Um, making sure that you're, you're, when you're in those meetings and you're talking to people, when you're tailing, when you're working at the front desk, everything that you're doing, you're making proper eye contact with people. Um, it doesn't mean like stare unblinkingly into their eyes, right? <laughs> um, uh, a comfortable, a comfortable uh, uh, look at their, at their eyes while you're speaking to them. If you look up, if you look down, if you look to the side, those are all signs of uh, dishonesty or um, disingen disingenuous. <laughs> yeah, um, or being, being disingenuous. Um, so we're actually gonna practice this one too. And this is gonna be, this is gonna be kind of, oh, where I set my phone? It's my pocket, all right. So we're actually gonna practice this one too. And this one's kind of fun to practice. Um, we're just gonna go through it really fast, just for one minute. Um, you're going to uh, look at the person next to you. Uh, reset, there we go. Um, uh, feel free to talk, feel free to communicate, whatever you wanna do, but looking, just looking at the person next to you. Okay, okay. So how'd that feel? Good. Yeah, good. It's okay, it's okay. I mean, I, so a couple of things you want to also know, don't look down when you're speaking to people because that's also that kind of submissive role. You don't want to do that when we're, when we're trying to meet people as equals, when we're trying to meet with, with um, uh, professionals. You want to make sure you're making good eye contact, all right? So posture, um, sitting up straight when you're in those meetings, don't lean back, don't slouch, um, uh, don't cross your arms. Um, once again, don't keep your head down, keep your head up, your shoulders back. Look like a professional and you're there to have that meeting with these people, right? Um, physical and verbal cues. Um, uh, don't, you know, glare over your glasses at people, crossing your arms. Any kind of barrier that you're building up between yourself and somebody else is a barrier that you're building, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't want to sit at a table like this. You want to have your hands open. Um, uh, you, you want to make sure that you're looking forward. Also, all that smiling, all that kind of stuff, okay? Um, and this is also where we kind of talk about, I'll have to come up here again, okay? So, um, first, me and Mel, as uh, 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 two women, I'm, I'm going to be a, a woman here, and we're both going to talk to each other. Women tend to talk to each other like this, right? Um, whereas, whereas, now Mel's going to be a man for a second, okay? And two men tend to stand, stand next to each other and talk to each other like this, okay? All right? And if men and women kind of stand a little bit off-center from each other when they're speaking to each other, which feels a little more comfortable. Those are just some of the social cues that you should be aware of. Now there's other, I mean, when you're talking about other cultures, I lived in Hong Kong for a long time, and in Hong Kong people talk like this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, which is, yeah. as an American, you know, yeah. we like our space a little bit. Being aware of that, there's also, that's also true of like some East Indian cultures, um, uh, and some, some other cultures around the country, you know. Um, all right, next one. Um, so, <laughs> something to be aware of, something to be aware of. Okay. Um, so servicing your campaign, so I'm really happy that we're starting this early. I mean, we are two years, two, yeah, a little bit more than two years away from a campaign in 2018. This is the most critical time of a campaign. I, I firmly believe that this is the most important time of any campaign. Um, servicing uh, is really a theory that came out in the 70s. People started showing up to Ohio two years before the primaries to start talking about themselves, to start delivering their message, to tell, start telling the stories about themselves. The best part about doing it right now is we have no opposition, right? 
Nobody's come, nobody's against <laughs> us. Um, I mean, the mayor might not want us to go in 2018 or whatever kind of stuff like that, but we don't have, we're not asking people to vote for us right now. We're not asking for money right now. We are just telling the story of the library right now. We have no, and we have no opposition to that at the moment, right? And we have that crazy guy who showed up to city council or whatever, that kind of stuff. But like, you don't have an organized opposition and you won't until you actually have a campaign. And this is your opportunity to really get messages out there. You see surfacing happening too, especially in libraries. We see it a lot. Um, about two years before any presidential candidate officially announces their candidacy, they publish a book, right? I mean, you had uh, Barack Obama do it, you had Michael K uh, 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 McCain do it, uh, Romney do it, somehow Sir Palin did it, like everybody writes a book, like two years before they announce their candidacy. Um, and that book is their opportunity, once again, to tell their story in their own words, mm -hmm. in their own messaging, in their own voice, to talk to the people about what their values are, what it is that they believe in, why it's so important that they're there, with, and without having any opposition. People can just read it. They don't have a bunch of opposition messages going through their head as they're reading their book. They just have that opportunity to read the book in an unbiased way. And that's our opportunity that we have right now, and we need to take advantage of it. Okay. So the first thing, start talking about community, communicating the need. You know, when we're going out and talking to the community, what are some of the things that are wrong with the library? It's okay to say there's things wrong with the library. That's okay. Um, but saying that there is a solution is also just important, right? So going out and saying, you know, the libraries need more, need, need a new code of paint. We can do a, a new code of paint. If you just support us, we can start doing these kinds of different things. Um, we need more books, or we need more programs, or we need more space. It's okay to communicate that need to the public. The public needs to know that there are needs that aren't being met in this community, and there are, that there are things that the library can be doing better uh, in this community. And what we like to do when we start working with the campaign, <clears throat> we don't have time to do it now, but those of you who are working on it should sit down and start writing down what all those needs are um, and start talking about how you're going to talk about those needs and, and how, how those needs can be solved. Um, uh, when we get to the actual campaign part, we teach staff how to do what's called AB messaging. And uh, since staff can't tell people to vote yes and they can't tell people to vote no for the library, what they can legally do is tell people what happens if they vote yes, which is plan A, and what, happens, what they get if they vote no, which is plan B. You're allowed to do that, but you're not allowed to tell people how to vote. And having that clear message starting now, these are the things that we can do with, with, with tax dollars. This is how great the library system can be. These are all the services we can meet. This is all the revitalization we can do in the communities. We have more literate population. We can help businesses more. Um, we can help the economy grow, all that kind of stuff. You have an opportunity to start talking about that right now, right? Okay, without any opposition again. Um, so building your base of support. So we're gonna start talking about how we get these supporters to come out, um, to show up to these meetings, to write letters, to talk to, the, to talk to other people to show up to volunteer or donate or take some kind of action on behalf of the campaign. And how do we start getting that going? So the very first thing is getting something back. And one of the things that you need to be thinking about when, you, when you're running a campaign is every opportunity that you do something, anytime you spend a resource, you should get something back, right? And there's nothing wrong with asking for something back. If you're spending your resources, if you're spending money to put on a uh, to put on a rally, don't be afraid to send around a clipboard to get the names and phone numbers, emails and addresses of every single person that's there. Right? We need people or we need money. Those are the two things that we need to always get back. If it's your name, phone number, that's fine. If it's their name, phone number, address, that's better. If it's name, phone number, address, and email address, that's the best, right? So we should be taking every opportunity to get that kind of stuff every time we do a meeting. Also, I sent around that, that earlier for you guys to sign up. Um, that's really, really important. Um, don't, 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 uh, don't do a letter writing campaign without like, if, if you're doing um, uh, house parties, making sure you get more people to show up, have them invite their friends, bring more people into it, any opportunity that you have to do stuff, right? Um, uh, if there are big rallies going on in the community for other things, don't be afraid to show up with a clipboard. If you're in front of Safeway, if you're tabling, start talking to people, booze in front of the libraries, start talking to people, getting their names, addresses, phone numbers, email addresses, um, all that stuff is gonna be really, really important. The more that you have now, the less you're gonna have to spend on finding those people later. Because in the campaign, it gets real expensive to start finding those people, right? We have to do it in like three months. Right now we have two years to find all those people. If you gotta cram it in two years or in three months, it gets real expensive, okay? Start doing it now while it's cheap. Um, developing the message. So 
I'm going to do, I'm not going to get real deep into developing the message. Developing a message is like a three to four hour uh, workshop that we do. I'm just going to kind of go over the details unless you guys check out a book on it or something new in the library, right? Um, <laughs> the first thing is uh, I want you guys to look up is what's called a message box. These message boxes are really powerful tools. Um, what you do is you make a box, uh, label each section like this. You want to label like what it is that we say about ourselves. What what, what great things that, that is it that the library does? Um, what what are the great things that the librarians do? What do we bring to the community? We are economic development agencies, or are we social welfare organizations? We teach kids to read. Um, uh, you know, we bring down um, crime rates where, where libraries are, are better funded. There's lower crime rates, all that kind of stuff. Um, then you have um, uh, your opposition. So they're talking about your opposition. Um, what they say about us. What does the opposition say about us? You know, a lot of times it's the anti-tax, anti-government stuff. You know, public employees, um, there's big cozy pensions. Um, you know, there's a lot of that kind of like public employees are lazy messages, you know, that kind of stuff that you really want to be aware of. Whenever you hear somebody in opposition, you just, you have a, like a Google Doc or something that everybody can, can write this stuff into. What do they say about us, right? Because you really want to be aware, aware of that. This is the hardest one to fill out, what they say about themselves, because you've got to put yourself in their position. At no time do one of these people think that they are a terrible person, right? <laughs> Even though, you know, you can have your own thoughts about them. Um, but they don't think that they're out there to do something terrible, to bring down the library. They don't think that they're doing something bad. Typically, what they believe is that they are uh, the guardians of the tax dollars. They are um, they are the watchdog of an, an over bureaucratic and, and, and uh, a wasteful government, and they're just protecting the poor people uh, who wouldn't who can't possibly save themselves, and they're the way and the light and whatever. And that's that's when you see those people who are showing up to city council. I mean, that's typically what you what kind of thing they believe about themselves, right? There's some kind of savior mentality right there. And putting yourself in the, those shoes and kind of saying just thinking about all the stuff that they think about themselves. Um, that's really that's that's really important to so understand that opposition. You can also do some opposition research here um, and find out more about them. Uh, what we say about them is right here, and we almost never use this box. We've only done it once. This is if your campaign goes negative. Um, what do we say about them? You know, uh, we had a campaign in Lafourche, uh, Lafourche Louisiana. Um, it was the only time we ever had to go negative, and it was because one of the parish. Uh, one of the parish counselors, I can't remember what they call called, parish something or other, um, uh, he said that the only people who, he was, well, he was trying to run a campaign to defund the library to fund the prison, right? So he's taking money away from the library to put it into the prison. And he said that the only people who use the library are, and he made a list of really racist terms for a lot of, for a lot of different groups of people, um, mostly uh, immigrants and minorities, um, like the worst, like the worst you could possibly say, a reporter caught it, and, we, when, and we, we found out about it on Wednesday. The campaign was on Saturday. We raised about $5,000 in about two days using all, all the negative messaging about him being racist and a terrible person and all that kind of stuff. Um, we were able to raise that money and tank his campaign in three days. This is a system that you use. 27 words, nine, nine seconds, three messages. 